TPN at technophilespodcast.com. I'm David Geisler, and this is the Technophiles Podcast. When we talk about ambient passive technology being aware of us and the utility to that, we're talking about a different type of technology. And I think those types of technologies aren't the ones that are enabling people being lazy. In this episode of the Technophiles Podcast, David and Alex discuss Apple's new HomePod, as well as what life might be like in a smart home five to ten years from now. Hey everybody, welcome to the Technophiles Podcast. I am your co-host, David Geisler, here this week with my co-host, Mr. Alex Sheehan. Alex, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Dave? Excited I'm well. to be co-hosting. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I mean, basically, we oh, so you're back on the show. Uh, look, we talked hold about on. this. Look. All right. I'm back on the show. It's been years, <laughs> years, and I'm excited. Um, so I was looking at our records, and the last time that you were an official cast member on the show was was it was about eight years ago. Yeah, if I had to guess, it would have been like between eight and eight hundred years ago, something <laughs> in that time frame. Alex Sheehan, I'm so excited. I already talked about this a little bit in episode 327 that I did with Jake, but um, Technophiles went through a little bit of a metamorphosis this uh, past winter, I guess. Our, our cast members moved all over the place. The show kind of logistically exploded, and for a while I hemmed and hawed, and I didn't know what to do, and I thought maybe I'd have to recast the show, and then I decided, well, I guess... I really like these people that I speak with. Let's maybe just bite the bullet here and do it as an online show, you know, even with a little bit of leg here and there, and even with only one or two people at a time, instead of four or five people sitting around a table, as I said last week, interrupting each other and things like that, because I think that the quality of the, what used to be cast, but what is now co-hosts um, is something that I didn't want to lose. Well, so really Alex, over the internet, co-hosts aren't going to interrupt you at all. <laughs> so we have that figured out. That's all. We got to figure it out. Thank you, technology. This is amazing. <laughs> Alex Sheehan, um, if people did not watch the fun little video that you and I made over the holidays, where Which we... I did, I was one of those people. You're one of those people that watched it. I, I, well, That's good. You, you tweeted it out, and I, I, I will stop interrupting at some point. But you tweeted That's it fine. out, and before I retweeted it, I wanted to listen to make sure I didn't say anything too stupid about blockchain before I then like also propagated it through my network. And the only really dumb thing that I said was yeah. uh, that tulip mania happened in like the eighties or nineties, which is true. If by eighties or nineties, I meant like the 14 eighties or the 14 nineties. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that yes, was, of course, well, uh, that was a, a fun a video. If you're listening to this show on YouTube right now, I'm putting the link up in the top. But if you're listening to us on iTunes or Google Play or Stitcher or anything like that, that's wonderful. We'll put a link down in the show notes. Alex, we are. what are we talking about? And then I want to catch up with you a little bit, but let's tell our audience what we're talking about this episode. I think we're talking about two kind of separate concepts. The one overarching thing is this idea of a virtual home assistant that goes with you wherever. Um, and I say home because we're specifically talking about the different devices built for your living room that these uh, virtual assistants live on. So things like the Echo, Google Home, and the HomePod, if it ever comes out. Oh, well, now here, wait just a second. When you and I were um, putting together our show notes, or I, I guess we were having like our pre-production meeting a week or so ago, I was asking you, oh, what do you want to talk about? And I said, oh, do you want to do, it's a little bit late, but do you want to do like CES recap or something else? What's kind of on your mind? You know, obviously Jake and I talked about the Falcon Heavy, which was very kind of present in the moment. Oops, I think I have notifications on. I, I'm so sorry. I'm incredibly professional right now. I'll stop texting um, you. You'll stop texting me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Show's going great, Dave. Sorry. Oh, man, this Dave, is really exciting. Dave, you look great on camera. <laughs> that sun looks like such a big, bright, actual sun. Not fake light. I'm oh, sorry. Did I break it? Did I wreck it? Man should behind the again? curtain. Should we start again? I don't know. No, I should take a picture. I'll take a picture on break. We need to keep this show rolling. But um, yes, we are recording late at night right now. And to keep a similar light value, I have a bunch of fake Kino flows over here. To make it kind of look like daylight coming through my window. My camera's pointed at like the wrong corner. I'm in my office and it's the only corner that doesn't have like shit on the walls. And okay. so it, it looks like I've been kidnapped by some terrorist organization it, well, and I'm tied to a it, chair. You have some music there with you, it looks oh, like. Right, Otherwise, yeah. it does look a bit right. dire. Well, it is, um, as you can see, oh, Prelude my. in E minor. So Chopin. I wouldn't mm -hmm. put it out of the realm of possibility that I'm still trapped by a terrorist organization having to play Chopin. 
Uh, so you happened. are. Well, let's talk about this. We're going to what happened was the the home pod is coming out as of as of the recording of this episode, which is probably about a week after people are actually hearing this. Quite frankly, um, it has not come out yet. It's about to come out in a couple days. And so we are talking about it kind of pre-release. Yep. And you said, well, what if we use that as a as a, a bouncing off point to just talk about personal assistance in general. And I said, Oh, I love that idea. I love it. So we're going to talk about the home pet pod. I almost keep calling it the home. It'll pod. Happen. The home pod. Um, <laughs> for the first half of the show today, we maybe we'll compare and contrast it to echo and, and uh, Google home and stuff like that. We'll take a break and come back. And then I really want to just kind of pick your brain about what you think the future of personal assistance and smart homes and smart speaker speakers is going to be. I certainly get excited about the, the concept And then we'll chat about that. Now, Alex, before we dive into the home pod conversation, though, you are, if I may, I haven't said this yet. You are Skyping in from New York. Now, are you over in Brooklyn these days or are you on the island? Where are you these days? I can't. Yeah, I know you moved recently. So uh, last time you were here, I believe I lived in Manhattan. And yes, it, it was actually you that introduced me to my rooftop, which I apparently didn't know I had access to until you came out. That was a stellar rooftop. Fantastic. Wait, how did I introduce you to it? Did I just start poking around and opening doors and then all of a sudden we were on a roof? I think so. It, it might have been like a New Year's Eve thing. And we're like, we yeah. have to figure out how to get to the roof so we can watch the fireworks. So it was at that point. Oh, no, I had tried going earlier, but there were like motion sensors that set off an alarm when you get close to the roof access door. Yes. So I put in a lot of sweat equity to get in good with my super and he turned it off for me. So then I see you were out. We got up to the roof. It was a good time. Well, it was a marvelous roof. We had a wonderful view of the Empire State Building. That was awesome. But now you're in Brooklyn. Yep. Skyping in. And this is great. Now we'll be we'll be talking to you probably about once a month here. I'll have a story. You'll have a story, that kind of thing. And uh, we'll just cycle through our cast members. So let's get to the show here. All right. Even though it was me, I just wanted to settle this stuff up because for a lot of people, this is the first time they're meeting you on this show. You know, a lot of my listeners. And nice to meet you. Hopefully. <laughs> so, Alex, may I ask you, since I have been doing all the uh, setup and intros, could you speak a little bit about the HomePod and its upcoming release? Right. So HomePod was, I believe it was announced, I think, at the same keynote as the iPhone 10. Yeah, I think so. It was about six months ago, wasn't it? Yeah, something like that. And and that's like two pretty big announcements to make at the same time when one physical product isn't actually being updated. Usually they split um, their year in half in terms of when they release these things. It'll be like a MacBook Pro refresh and the announcement of some update to iPhone or vice versa or whatever. Right. Um, but here they announced two products that aren't going to be hitting the shelves for a while. And I don't know why. Who knows? But they're playing up the HomePod as, as, a, as a pretty... Um, giant step in terms of home speakers and a home for the personal assistant. And mm-hmm. we'll probably use some intellectual property as I describe these things, because Google owns home and Apple owns pods and home as well. So if anything's well, unclear, we're usually going to be talking about the Apple home pod, I feel. So just stay locked in let, on that. Allow me to interject for a second. Um, over the last two seasons, season eight and season nine, there has been a lot of smart home um, types of conversations that have happened on this show. And uh, I remember two years ago, the Apple TV got a firmware update that had some home kit running inside of it. And everybody thought, oh, this is it. This is the moment. This is the moment that Apple integrates the smart home. And then uh, about a year and it didn't it kind of happened, but it didn't quite happen. I mean, it, it did technically, but it didn't you know, revolutionize the industry. Um Whereas where in that case, I think the Apple TV actually works as a as a pod, as a, almost a hub that you can communicate to even out of your network and stuff like that. But I'll keep moving along here at the risk of being a little bit incorrect. But basically, <laughs> I've got it right, I think. Isn't that right? Yeah. Um, OK, well, then and then there was like we did an episode about a year ago about finally apple's gonna make a real tv and and i don't you know we didn't know if we cared or not but that's what the industry was talking about at the time and so we were talking about well what does that mean and then we were thinking this is the moment that apple will integrate the smart home and that the tv will be the the iphone of the house and that that's what's gonna happen and then they just released an actual thicker puck with more software in it you know the new apple tv which was just the puck got rid so, of audio out and some other things that most people care yes. about but apple does not so that's right. Cool. And so in the meantime, since that uh, Google has released, you know, the Alexa has been happening for years. Uh, Google released their 
or their Google Home, which we spoke about a little bit about a year or so ago. In fact, our our co cast member, I guess, Jake Gill, who was in the previous episode, he owns an OK or an OK Google. That's so funny. He owns a Google Home and um and uses it regularly. Apparently, I know he runs. He's a kind of an Apple guy too, but he runs Chromecast on his TV and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So anyway, man alive, do is. The HomePod going to finally be the thing? Is it going to be the Google Home, the Amazon Alexa? Is it going to be the thing that will finally allow a house, theoretically, to be a smart house? I know that's a leap, but right. what do you think? I, I don't think so. I, I think that um, to, to have... Well, there's... <laughs> that's a big question. Um, let yes, me, it is. Let me start by addressing the Echo and the Google Home. And I think that between those two systems, they're really pretty much fungible with one or the other. Amazon may be ahead in terms of the, the software development kits that it can offer its developers, but really they're, right. it's kind of like a land grab opportunity for both Google and Amazon. And whoever can get these things in the most hands first is going to have a better market share for their app ecosystem. And that's sort of the play between those two, I think. And yeah, there's okay audio. They can like talk to you and have their virtual assistants on board and that's all cool. But I think the distinction with the HomePod, and this will go into the, the concept of the smart home is that it seems to me that Apple's making this a, a smart speaker first, more than anything. Yeah. And it seems like um, this is true across a lot of their product lines, is that Siri almost takes a back seat to the features of the hardware itself. I agree. I agree. And I think that's good. I think that's a good thing, because what, what I see in a smart home is an ecosystem that's much more vast than your mobile device in your pocket, your watch, and a speaker in the living room. Um, yeah. I see it being, and I know that like we've had some half-hearted attempts at things like this already, but I think it's your refrigerator. I think it's your thermostat. I think it's the locks in your door. It's your lights. It's all of that. And I think that the assistant has to sit in the back seat and drive all of those things. It doesn't need mm-hmm. to be the killer feature of that device. The killer feature of the HomePod is the sound system and, right. and how it can... It, it has like a, a, if you look at it and you're familiar with like the, the uh, Mac Pro in its current iteration, it's kind of the same form factor, the same footprint. Um, it has speakers all around, an array of, I think, like seven or eight different tweeters at the bottom. Yeah, and I'm showing a graphic right now. Right on. Okay, I'm probably looking at the same graphic then on Apple.com. Um, they've got microphones throughout it as well. It looks like six microphones and then uh, an A8 chip integrated right into the speaker. Right. So that's going to do some pretty cool things computationally, including measuring the room where it is in relation to walls and adjust the sound accordingly. And some of the early things we saw from people demoing this thing is that they would walk around a room and it would almost catch them off guard in the the sound doesn't change, right? Like if you're walking around a normal single point speaker, you're walking yeah. around, you, your, your brain and your ears are telling you that that where that is in relation to you. Sure. Like a single light bulb on a theater stage that there's exactly you're yeah. you're very aware of where that light bulb is. Yes, very much so. Uh, but with this, they say yeah, we really can't tell. So that's it's almost like the same thing with when sous vide came out right away. People were cooking these steaks to perfection and it just felt weird because it was right. absolutely perfect. And there was no deviation from that. So now you have things where you have to like blowtorch the steak to make it give it a little char and. Also, yeah, you have to put some things. of that texture there. People yeah. are Instagramming their steaks like if they have to add some texture back on. And that's but, so new um, Instagramming food. I didn't think that was even all that popular. <laughs> but I think that so, the, um, the approach well, is smart well, here, yeah. right? It's it's okay. The, your personal assistant is going to run the show. Uh, and the more smart devices we get in the home, the more your home is going to be able to observe you and interact with you. And Siri is going to be the point of contact for all those devices and all those interfaces. But the devices themselves have to be the best device in that category. And if Apple can make it great. Now, Siri is, you know, Siri was kind of the first and then, OK, Google came along and Alexa. Um, however, in a lot of tests, sometimes Siri it doesn't seem to be, and this is a very general statement, does not appear to be as robust with like search as Google Home is or as robust with, frankly, like keeping track of items and ordering things like the Alexa. Um, I use Siri constantly, honestly. I Whenever I'm driving, I use the Hey Siri thing to check stuff, to to ask about stuff, to know what my schedule is, to add files to things. I actually find myself using Siri quite often. So I guess I'm a fan of personal assistance and, and certainly a fan of... Um, touchless personal assistance. Right. 
So, you know, I always kind of got excited about Siri in the house. In fact, if I may, about three or four years ago, when Siri first came out, I got very excited and I bought a Bluetooth speaker with a microphone in it. And that microphone was usually the idea was, oh, you put this speaker down and it will uh, kind of become like a speakerphone in the middle of your room. And then it's Bluetooth to your phone and your, your phone treats it like it's one of these earpieces that people wear or whatever. Yeah. Well, I found out that by pressing and holding the play button on that speaker, I could bring Siri up. You know, this is before the Hey Siri stuff. This is back when they when it wasn't listening, when you had to turn it on by holding down the home button. And oh, my goodness, like my world opened up. This little puck (laughs) stayed in the middle of my apartment and I would push it and my phone would be in a different room half the time. I wouldn't even think about it or be in my pocket. And I was talking to Siri left and right. Maybe I was a fanboy and I was trying to use it more than I needed to. But it technically worked. And so I remember when Siri got integrated into the Apple TV about a year or two ago, and they kind of worked it into the microphone of the remote. Um, I was also kind of excited about that. I thought, oh, finally, Apple's making the microphone that goes into the room. And I do agree that the HomePod, it's being sold. It costs, you know, $350, which is hundreds and hundreds of dollars more than really the echo or the home it's certainly the base models the echo has a they both have like premium models that are very similar in price echo has the echo show which is 300 and then there's this like google google max which is actually 400 and the google max looks very very similar to the home pod to me in that it even does some of that dynamic sound reading where it pings out it can kind of feel the sound waves in the room well i think Sorry, yes. go ahead. Finish your point. No, 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 it's fine. Yeah, I know. I was rambling a little bit, but um, <laughs> where I was trying to pull it back to, what I was trying to pull it back to was that the idea that this pod, which is, this looks like the size of a small basketball, maybe even a little smaller than a small basketball. Maybe that's not, maybe it's the size of a small watermelon. I don't know. You know, the home pod, right? When we're <laughs> trying to visualize it. The idea that you can just take this thing and put it anywhere in a room is exciting to me. Yeah. Well, I think that it's, um, yeah, this, yeah, yeah, this kind of coincides with um, each company playing to their strengths. And you mentioned that you know Google might be doing a little better job at search, and Amazon or might be doing a little better job at like uh, based on certain supply chain. based on certain research things. And we have yeah. links to those research things in our uh, show notes here. And full not dis- necessarily all of them. Full disclosure: these opinions are my own. I'm a Google employee, but I will <laughs> not. I will not bat for the home team in this episode. Uh, so I think like, okay, yeah, obviously Google's going to be better at search. It's going to leverage its, its existing technology. It's going to leverage G Suite to give you the experience that it can in the domain that it's an expert in. Same thing with Alexa and Amazon, right? They, they control a large percentage of the global supply chain, and they have a huge inventory of user data and product data. So they're going to use yeah. that to stitch together the best possible thing they can do there. Alex, uh, hmm, Alex, Apple. Alex. <laughs> Apple, I don't have any of that either, but Apple doesn't have any of that. So they have to take the wins where they can get it. So they have to be the best speaker because they have engineers who can build the best speaker. They don't need any domain specific data to do that. Right. Um, right. On top of that. Yes. So yes, that's true. Apple's big play with Siri and a large part of the um, the keynote for the HomePod was that Siri uh, sounds the most lifelike and. I'm going to talk a little bit about like how they do that. But the why I think is pretty clear is that they, they okay. can't make Siri smarter because they don't have as much data as Amazon or Google does. Right. Yeah. It's that simple, isn't it? So they, what they can do is they can hire a bunch of PhDs and they can set up a recording studio. And mm-hmm. uh, so this, yeah. this concept in computer science is speech synthesis and text to speech. And basically what they're doing is they're recording like 10 to 20 hours of each one of these voices and they're breaking every little sound that you can make in a human sentence into like, okay, let's say, let's say like the CH sound is one unit of speech. They break sure. those in half, right? And they save all of those to a database. And then they build a, a system of, they call it a front end and a back end system. I, I don't think that's domain specific. I think that's Apple uh, Apple speech for it, for what they build with their system. And the front okay. end system is like breaking down speech to text and normalizing that text. Like if you have numbers in the text, they, they like write it out. If you have like idioms in the text, they, they can put markers in there. Um, and then they use a technique called deep mixture density networks. What that does is it says based on any given inputs, uh, what is the best possible way I can stitch together 
all of those little half phones that I saved earlier, right? So that CH sound chopped in half. How can I stitch those all together to make a coherent sentence that sounds human-like? And okay. this is the kind of research that Apple's putting into Siri that I don't think Amazon or Google are putting into their personal assistants. Right. I mean, when you hear commercials for Alexa, I think that that's kind of uh, buffed a little bit for mm-hmm. the promotional stuff, to be honest. And when I see when I use Alexa and Google Home in person, it's much more of the kind of Gladys thing from Portal, which was mm-hmm. a play on Siri in the first place. But this second I want to add to that this second generation of Siri, the one that I guess they marketed it when these this new batch of iPhones came out or iOS 11 came out. So when they upgraded the voices, it's wonderful. Yeah, no, it's, it's very like good. it sounds like a person talking to you at this point, so much so that I've had some fun with it. And I have a, a MacBook, a iPhone and an iPad. And I did a thing where I gave my iPhone male British voice yep. setting. I gave my <laughs> iPad female British and then oh, I gave man, my Dave. MacBook male american so all my devices have different what they have different voices and it's they're they're all of them sound great i feel like this is a whole chapter in mind though like the next thing for you is to start a church on fire and like storm poland (laughs) that's not i don't think that's healthy it's a good idea it's clever but i don't don't as an experiment well, I'm not naming them or anything like that, but it's like it's like, oh, my MacBook has a male you're voice. Have my to iPhone. End up Sophie's choosing one of these devices at some point. Like you're gonna have <laughs> you're gonna have only one outlet and one charger, and you're gonna be like your iPad Harry over there. Is and- it Jeremy <laughs> or Madeline? <laughs> Um, but no, the, the, the impetus, the whole thing was actually the truth is I wanted to experiment with male British on my phone because when I drive, I pretend it's Jarvis. I 100% do. Yeah, I, I made mine male Australian because when I worked at a, a different company before this, it was an ad tech company. I worked with a lot of Australian people and I okay. wanted to assert my dominance over them. So just having <laughs> Siri in the ma- male Australian voice made me feel like I had this power over them and they, they were at my beck and call for whatever I wanted to know. Sure. But it all plays back, sure. right? Like playing to their strengths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apple we have a couple more minutes of... here before break. I'm sorry. Let's, yeah, no, no, uh, yeah. I want you to be able to say whatever you want to say. Uh, Apple has a lot of data in terms of being able to record a voice and hire PhDs. And it also has the benefit of all of your text messages and email going straight through their devices. So they have a lot of training data for mm-hmm. natural language understanding, which I think is where they're kind of knocking it out of the park here. Being I would the agree. best in class hardware and the most human sounding personal assistant. Um, and so as far as the, the products, I know, I know I just said, Oh, we got to go to break and I kind of cut you off. I apologize, but I don't want to just totally cut this off before we start really talking about the future of smart homes and all that kind of stuff. Personally, how do you feel about the consumer ecosystem of smart speakers? Have, you know, uh, Amazon having like five or six different versions of their Echo at different price points that can uh, do different things, but all still run Alexa, Google Home doing the very kind of straightforward three tiered thing with the Google Mini, the Google Home Mini, the Google Home and the Google Home Max. That's kind of the old fashioned Old Navy Gap Banana Republic model. Yep. Um and then we have Apple doing what Apple usually does. They say, no, we're going to make one. Well, in a, in a Steve Jobs era, it was like, we're making one thing and you're going to like it and it's going to be amazing. These days, they start to s- spread out a little bit more um, yeah. now with obviously with Tim Cook and everything. But um, how do you feel about this current ecosystem for uh, consumers? Well, I think that uh, if you ever wondered what the benefit of having all these users and all this cash was, it is this, right? So um, if any of these were a startup, they would have to bet the farm on one device. But since it's Amazon, since they have distribution networks, since they have warehouses to build all these things, they can buy at scale. Uh, and because of that, they can economically make five different models of an Echo. And same thing yep. with Google. And Google's doing it a little bit differently as well. They're, they're sort of like, they, they don't have all these warehouses. They don't have such a big distribution network, but they still have a bunch of cash. So they can build three product lines and see which one is the best. They can they can do market testing by rolling out three or five different products. Mm-hmm. I think that Apple uh, is banking on its history, banking on its track record of, all right, we have one phone. Okay, they have like 10, but one phone, it's right, going right, to right. control the ecosystem. One laptop, it's going to control the ecosystem. One smart home speaker, it's going to control the ecosystem. Uh, yes. So I think it's great for consumers that, I mean, 
in this case, it's great for consumers that there's such a big market share, so much cash available, and such a huge distribution network from these three big companies because it gives you a lot of options. Um, and so, like, you know, this is what I think about. I think with Apple, it makes sense. The selling point. So, OK, when you see an Alexa commercial or you read an article about Alexa, no, 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 no. Let's keep it really general. When any person sees an Alexa commercial on television or before a YouTube video or who cares what, um, they're definitely sell the, 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 they're selling the assistant. Like that's what's being sold in those commercials. Yes. And even Google Home, for the most part, they're selling the assistant. A lot of times with Google Home, they're they market towards this natural language thing where they say, you know, there's even that commercial that's out there in front of YouTube videos right now of like, hey, what's the hipster song with the whistling? Okay, fine. Google Google can use that and use its search algorithms. That's not a matter of Google Home knowing what you're saying. That's actually just a matter of Google having a really good search engine. And when you literally take the words, the song with whistling that has hipsters or whatever, like you could type that into Google and it would probably work. That's where Google is excelling. What I want to ask you is, why would someone, and I'm kind of asking this with a sense of humor here a little bit, but if you can get an Echo Dot for $50 or an Echo Show for $230, okay, one has a screen and one's tiny, but at the end of the day, they're all speaking to the same server that runs Alexa, what's the point in having different tiers, in your opinion? In my opinion, I, I truly think, well, this is two parts, right? Uh, let's let's start with right uh, product market fit. I think is a big thing, and that's what Amazon and Google are trying to figure out right now. Is it, maybe in five years Amazon's going to pare it down to just two or three yeah. different devices that can interface with Alexa. Maybe they're trying instead of guessing what people will pay. They're trying to throw all the spaghetti at the wall, and they literally almost kind of see what sticks here. And really, I don't think that the device is going to make them much money in the future. I think they could throw away the device. Once they've captured all the users into Alexa, that's where all the money's going to be made in the third-party app economy. They, they see mm. this as what the iPhone did for applications on a mobile device. Yes. Right? The, the second iteration of the iPhone opened up the ecosystem for third-party app developers, and now it's a multi-billion dollar revenue stream for Apple. And I truly think that that's going to be the case for this, this um, smart speaker personal assistant ecosystem is that this is going to get opened up and become a huge third-party application market. And we're already seeing Amazon do it really well, uh, to be honest. Like they, they have some pretty great APIs and SDKs and a lot of ways yes. to interface with Alexa. These Every things, time I turn around, yeah. there's some tiny home that's integrating. There's an Adreno that's integrating. Every time I turn around, someone's integrating. It's always with Alexa because it's easy to work with. It yep. is. Yep. And I, I think that... Um, so product market fit is one. They're trying to figure out what the best, which, which of the best five, uh, is going to sell the most broadly. I think they're also, um, they also need to like package these things differently, right? So Google is giving these Google homes away with the purchase of a pixel two in some cases. Mm -hmm. So that requires a cheap device that interfaces with, okay, Google, right? You don't want to give away a $350 smart speaker with a $600 smartphone. You want to give away the $150 smart speaker, get OK Google and other Google products integrated in your human day-to-day uh, behaviors. So what does a consumer not get if they get, for example, a Google Home Mini? I have no idea. Probably nothing. They prob- they, I would imagine get the same experience as they would maybe with less fidelity in, in the yeah. actual sound. Um, right. Other than that, so it, I, I haven't seen any deviation from like what the, the product offers. Yeah, it does seem like that might be it. I know the Google Home, the middle, the mid-level one, the the big pitch is that they can kind of hive off each other and be you can they want you to buy a couple of these and put them all over your home and they can play music throughout the home and that kind of thing. And, and maybe in a in a future world, they could even have that music travel with you. But yeah. that's not what's going on right now. Um, <clears throat> the Google Home Max is, a, in my opinion, a clear competitor or a response to the home pod situation and it, it, it seems it looks like it even acts very similarly but that mini confuses me it, maybe <laughs> that one really is just the microphone and the speaker to google home you, you might as well yeah. put your phone down on the table almost you yeah. know yeah and if i were a betting man i'd say that's that's the play it's not it's not any of these devices it's which vertically you choose amazon google or 
Apple. Yeah. And then, you know, someone says, oh, I really want that Google Home. Well, uh, you know, for now, I can go buy the $50 one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll try mm-hmm. that out. And then they, yep. and a, and a two years later, they want to buy the Google Home anyway. Yep. So it just as from a market point of view, and I do want to go, I know we're going 10 minutes over on break here, but you oh. got my brain going here. Sorry. Um, no, no, no. It's great. Thank you. I, it's fun. I'm kind of interviewing you a little bit about your thoughts on this. Well, that's one thing that's different about this show now is that it's only two people talking. So it does turn into that a little bit yeah, instead yeah. of like four people kind of brainstorming. Yeah. However, with that said... Does Apple, in your opinion, you know, like they're releasing one really expensive model? Yeah. Now, that's kind of Apple's branding is there's going to be one thing. It's going to be high end and, and you're going to buy it or you or you won't. Right. Um, they've, they've that has been slipping a little bit with the phones lately. Oh, don't get me started. I <laughs> I think that Apple is writing the worst software in the world right now. It's so bad. You mean iOS but, specifically, iOS 11? iOS and Mac OS specifically. Like there's, yeah. there's been some pretty rough sailing the past few months for Apple in terms of their software releases for the major platforms. Well, you're absolutely right. In fact, uh, iOS 11.2.5 uh-huh. just came out recently, which actually was the um, the 10th update to iOS 11. Yeah. It came out only two weeks after they had to do that patch update for the crazy virus situation. Yeah, so they, they use something called semantic versioning, and a lot of software uses this. It's um, a major, minor, and patch version separated by dots, right? So 1.1.1, uh, major version 1, minor version 1, patch version 1. The higher uh, number yes. you have at the end there, usually the crappier it's it's going for you because that means that you're deviating <laughs> from your normal, normal release schedule. And that's not good. Yep. That's always to like put out a fire. So, you know, you get an 11.1. That's fun. Maybe there's an extra yeah. feature. 11.2. Cool. Now it connects to a blah, blah, blah. Cool. But we're at 11.2.5. That means that they've patched 11.2 five times already. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And now that's, is that, you know, is that just, the industry or or is it actually because you know apple tends to have well i don't know you know what let's save this maybe we come back to this yeah because maybe we have another episode about security and all of that and maybe we touch on that a little bit on the second half here but i'd love to have that conversation with you maybe another month from now or something where we can really focus on it but that is very very interesting you're absolutely right there's updates left and right and and apple has had to do some really crazy stuff lately alex let us go to break i'll be back in 30 seconds or so, 40 seconds. I'll be there, and, I'll be there um, with you. You'll still be here? Sounds good. Yeah. And we'll I just can't go anywhere. Of, I'm in a prison. I'm locked up. <laughs> uh, you have a guitar and a, and a keyboard, it looks like. Okay, yeah. So we will just kind of throw the notes away here and talk all about... Here it is. Very dramatic. Um, how we feel the future of personal assistants and smart homes, what, what it could be, pros and cons and all the rest. Yep. Sounds good. Cool, man. See you in a bit. Hey Siri, I'm home. Could you please just roll those shades right down? I want to snooze. Hey Siri. The Philip Hughes connected, color palette selected. My eye watches Buddha, geofence is erected. Got the passive sensors on and now you know everything that's happening in my home. Hey Siri, I'm gone. I left the lights on in my bedroom. Now it's true. Could you please turn them off and maybe check the pantry cause I think I'm out of cashews Got this brand new condo with a home kit Left the front door unlocked, you took care of it Hey Siri, you know exactly where we'll be Friday night at 8.52 in the kitchen now but you already know you ain't stalking me we're just taking it real slow your smooth british voice making me feel so tough you know how to make me feel one with my stuff From TPN at technophilespodcast.com, I'm David Geisler, and this is the Technophiles Podcast. All right, and we are back from the break. I am here, of course, with Mr. Alex Sheehan, Skyping in from Brooklyn. Alex, um, we're having a pretty good conversation. I'm enjoying it quite a bit right now. I don't know what's in store for the second half. I have some notes and some examples of things that I think are cool examples of 
the future of smart homes and personal assistance. Oh, hey, let me start this whole thing off by asking you this. When I was putting the show notes together, I was thinking to myself, what do I call this? Do I, oh. is it smart homes? Is it personal assistance? Is it smart speakers? Is it digital? Is like, what is this industry called? Well, I think um, we could leave that up to Siri to tell us, right? Seriously? If I, if I pop in right here and, and I go into my settings on uh, my iPhone, I think she's going to pretty easily define what she is. Um, all right, so we're Siri in search. Let's, uh, let's see. For the audio listeners, Alex is bringing up the phone to his mouth right now, and he's about to ask her something, it looks like. Oh, yes, oh. he's about to ask it. Siri is an it. Yeah. I, oh man, okay. That is an important distinction. I Ooh, correct we, everyone I find about that because these things are going to get well, really actually, good and get a lot more lifelike. And yeah, I think it's not super healthy to think of it as a person. So, well, okay. So, so this kind of, this kind of, I can't help but think about when I was telling you about how I changed the voices on all my devices. I'm definitely doing that for the fun of it. And I do enjoy it. I do not personify them or consider them, you know, like I'm, I'm more connected to my plants than I am to the, the possible <laughs> identity of, of these virtual assistants. Um, and I enjoyed that very much, like in the in the in the film Her, where it's intuitively obvious that he's not talking to a single that entity of artificial intelligence is is just running those algorithms with everybody. It's the same central hub and brain and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I I have no interest in projecting onto these artificial intelligences um, any kind of emotion or anything like that. However. I do enjoy some of them having male voices and some of them having female voices and Siri isn't it. And Alexa though, can Alexa, does Alexa only have one voice? Cause one of my notes here that I have, and I'll put the link in our show notes, like I've been saying a lot tonight is that there was actually a lawsuit about um, app for Apple and Amazon projecting, you know, the female voice to be subservient through these things, passively doing that. Interesting. And some people got very upset about that. And I can see that point a little bit. But, um, you know, Apple, people might forget that there's six different versions of Siri's voice, half of which are male. I guess the default is female right now. Yes. Um, I wonder if they did that. I mean, they clearly didn't do it consciously to make the female seem subservient. I'm wondering, though, like if it was. (sighs) So you look in, in movies and media and you see these robot voices usually being male. Um, Maybe the ship in Futurama is a female. Uh, But I I guarantee they did some pretty thorough market research to to see what would be the most comfortable for people in their personal assistants. Because the thing that I think is dangerous with considering these humans is not so much that like, we're going to be so tied into these things. It'll be sad to turn them off. It's not data from star Wars or star. Oh boy. I'm going to get emails for that. It's not data from star Trek. Right. Right. Um, but there's going to be emergent behavior from these things as they get smarter and as they can function more like a human. And by emergent behavior, I mean something like given a set of inputs, we have an expected outcome for a program. But in a complex program, you could have side effects that you can't predict given a set of, of inputs. So yeah. when it when there's behavior that's emergent from the intended behavior, that's what I mean by emergent behavior. Now, we have to figure out, like, if we interact with these things and expect a human response. And there's some behavior that deviates from that. If that happens on a small enough scale over and over and over again, what's that going to do to our brain chemistry, right? If we, if we're expecting a human response and it goes off the rails in some certain scenario, that kind of plays into, to how we need to be treating these things. Uh, now seeing Siri, as a female voice, meaning uh, and getting it in your head that ma- that means women is, are subservient goes hand in hand with that, right? Like, if you have a personal assistant and it does whatever you want, and you associate a female voice with a thing that does whatever you want, I think mm-hmm. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but it seems intuitively possible that you would start feeling that way about other humans. Um, Sure. That's the kind of thing we have to be wary of. I feel, I don't think we have to be wary of it. The robots rising up and killing us in some robot apocalypse. 
it's it's the, the small things, right? Like the boiling a frog in water that will sneak up on us and potentially be harmful. Yes, I agree. And um, <clears throat> pardon me, you know, uh, so sorry, I'm getting messages here. I, I don't know. I put my stuff on do not disturb, but apparently I didn't do it correctly. Um, uh, let me see it. Now I lost my train of thought. I, I'm so sorry. I don't want to edit this out either. I want to just keep going. So uh, what I was thinking, though, is, yes, um, you know, you can have Siri call you a nickname mm -hmm. for, a, for a, a couple months. I had Siri call me dude because it was just funny to be like, turn left, dude. And <laughs> it's like it was just call, kind of funny when you name Link something that's not Link in Legend of Zelda. If you call indeed, him my dude indeed. and you get the. The, so uh, uh, in episode three, I have a I have a side show called the uh, another Zelda podcast that I do with a gal named Kate Fisher. And we record that, um, you know, every two weeks. And our most recent episode was just posted a couple days ago. She was talking about putting like swear words in for Link's name and stuff. <laughs> and then and she was like, yeah, and it's because I'm 12 years old. But yeah, I'm anyway, still yes. uh, adolescent enough to find that absolutely hilarious because I'm at a point where I'm starting to name Link. Link, not even my name, <laughs> because I want the characters to call him by his name or whatever, not my name, but whatever. That's sure. that is a show that is an episode for a different show. Um, so you can have Siri call you different names. You cannot change Siri's name. But now Alexa and Google or Amazon and Google have have kind of toyed around with that a little bit. Um, with Alexa, you can say three different things. You can switch it to, hey, Alexa. Okay, wait, I have it in my notes here. What is it? What is it? Oh, no, Google switched it to OK Google. Hey, Google. And then um, with Alexa, you can also switch it to like OK Computer or Hey Computer and all that kind of stuff. OK, this is all cute and clever. But is this the beginning of things changing names? Because I have another link here from 9 to 5 Google that in the APK um, for the next operating for the next update for Google Home, there is a variable null for renaming Google Home hmm. in the code that people have been have found this. And that's the quick way of saying it. And I will have a link to this in our show notes. Um, so now if you can start naming, you know, the, the joke of don't name it, right? Don't name it. Then you'll want to keep it. <laughs> is this the beginning of that? I guess it could be. And that speaks more to the point from the first half of the episode is that hopefully these are like throwaway devices to get you in the ecosystem. But if we're naming these things, you're going to develop some pretty strong feelings for the little box that sits next to your TV or your computer. Mm hmm. Or the big mouth Billy Bass that you're hacking to be Alexa, <laughs> whichever it may be. So let's re reel it in here for a little bit um, without going too far out into the future and science fiction and all that kind of stuff. I think what we were just discussing is legitimate on a more um, immediate level. How do you see these personal assistants affecting? I like to talk about the smart home. I'd like to talk about the smart home a little yeah. bit and how that will be interfacing, because I do think that Google Home, Alexa and now the HomePod will be a bridge to that experience for sure. Yeah, I think that it's going to look a lot like the the smartphone ecosystem does right now, where you have two major players. You have iOS and Android. Android has a majority of the market, but it's two platforms, basically. And um, there, there exists a problem right now in the Internet of Things and smart homes, and that is that there's no industry-leading protocol to control or interact with any of these devices. And I think that what we're seeing right now is a foundation for all of that, right? Whichever platform takes over this space, I feel is going to be the logical choice for future Internet of Things and smart home devices. And that's to say that if Apple can capture, whatever, 60% of the market, uh, that means that in the future, they may partner, they may buy, they may release third-party uh, platforms for other people to build on top of, right? And we saw this with the iPhone in software. We may see this with the smart home in actual hardware devices. Um, similar to how Philips Hue interacts with the home app on your phone. Um, right. So this is, I think, the, the first step in solving the issue of not having an industry-wide protocol to, to control these devices. Right. Each each company has their own kit. I mean, Apple literally markets theirs as home kit. Do you know what the names are for the Google and the Amazon equivalents? So uh, I believe it's Alexa's skill kit. And I skill kit. Embarrassingly enough, don't know what Google's is. 
And let me kind of try with, with my almost layman understanding of this. Let me know if I'm accurately explaining this or not for people who maybe aren't even familiar with with how this works. You know, like the HomePod runs a version of iOS in it. Um, Alexa runs a version of software in it. They have these softwares, but a kit in this context, a kit is a a language that allows you to have a bunch of plugs that are mildly adaptable, but you can take parts of your if you're a third party uh, company and you have certain things that you want to just kind of jack into certain plugs of this code, the kit will take that and bring it to the appropriate places on the actual operating system to do what it needs to do. Is that a decent way of explaining that? Yeah, I think so. Um, another way to, to conceptualize it is there's software in every operating system on any computer that is in charge of controlling every pixel in your display. You don't have to yeah. rewrite that code if you're building a website. You yeah, write code right, right, right. that interacts with that code. And yeah, that's a great way of saying it. What the vendors will provide are those, those inputs for you to, mm-hmm. to use, right? So that's what we talk about when we talk about an SDK or an API is it's a set of instructions that we can feed directly into a platform and have it do cl- that platform specific stuff so we don't have to rewrite it over and over again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was I was speaking to actually, I think it was my sister and she was saying, well, wait, does it is it HomeKit or is it iOS or like, what is it running? And I said, well, it's running, I guess you could say iOS, but it's using HomeKit. HomeKit is a I guess you is it accurate to say that it's a language for a common language for people for app developers to use when they're, you know, when Philips Hue needs their Philips app to work with HomeKit or HealthKit is similar. You know, the HealthKit, I've been having a lot of fun with the HealthKit, HealthKit specifically for the last year or two. I have one app that puts my weight in. I have another app that reads my calories and another app that does my heart rate and all that kind of yeah. stuff. But it all comes to a hub using HealthKit, which is a different piece of language that, um, that uh, pulls all that data together, even though the apps themselves are third party and unique apps, they're using the same wires and plugs. HomeKit works the same way. And I assume that that's also the concept with Google Home. And as you just implied earlier, Alexa as well. Yeah. The only thing I'd add to that is that um, technically it's not necessarily the same language. When we talk about the, the language abstraction, we're talking about a programming language usually. And for Apple products, that language is Objective C or Swift. For Android and other Google products, that language is Java. And when we talk about SDKs, in SDK, let's take HomeKit, your example, right? Um, with HomeKit, Apple is plopping a huge library of pre-written code in your hands and saying, if you want to, uh, if you have a, a product that is a light bulb, and you want to be able to turn that light bulb on from an iOS app, use this chunk of code and just type a one line thing into your code base and we'll do the rest. It's the same language. Right. So Objective-C on both sides, both on the SDK oh, and right, right, on right. your client code. But they're giving you a library of pre-written Objective-C that you can use in your applications. And that's the only thing I would add. Otherwise, the description was great. Wonderful. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so what are some of the what are some of the exciting ways that you think home HomeKit type interfaces will be affecting the way we live for the next five to ten years? Yeah, I think it's passive sensors, and we haven't. I don't think we've really seen anything commercially that is good at this yet. Let me say, not commercially, because there's a lot of stuff in like global supply chains that do this um, in an ambient fashion. And by ambient, I mean knowing where you are and what you're doing. We haven't seen anything available in an Apple store that we can pick up off a shelf and put into our home yet. Um, right. A lot of these things work on a schedule. So chronologically, it says 8 a.m. is usually when you wake up. Let's turn the lights up to 25% to help you wake up. Um, I know from some geofence that this that you're entering your home again after your workday. Let's bring the lights mm-hmm. up again. But they, they can't really watch you. And so I think passive sensors are going to be key in making these things feel a little more organic, right? Right. Right. So an example of that would be um, uh, if, like instead of saying, hey, Siri, unlock my door, a passive sensor might be just as a broad example. Um, you have a geofence set up of, uh, you know, 600 feet from your house and your Apple Watch pings it and triggers it. And then the whole kit talks to itself and knows to unlock the door or, or turn the light, the, the front porch light on or something like that. Instead of like pulling up, you know, these days, like even the hue is a bit mm-hmm. like this. You pull up your app and you kind of touch the buttons and it's really not that different than hitting a light switch on the right. wall. You're just doing it from your phone. Right. I think that's what you're speaking to. Is that right? Absolutely right. And I think it's, you know, it's 
in a in a simple form, it could be like infrared sensors detecting where you are in the room. In reality, it's probably going to be some sort of Wi-Fi network detecting where you are based on like where signals are bouncing off of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe in a future iteration of the home app, you can turn on a feature that says turn on the lights in the room that I'm on as I'm walking through my home. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I just recalled that on the show about a year and a half ago, we did a quick story about some home kit updates. And many of those updates were sensor based that they were yep. writing into the code about sensors. Another, an example of that was a like a carbon dioxide sensor for your garage that would feel, you know, if the car, there's too much car, like a lot of these people that have garages that are connected to their home. That can be fairly toxic after a while absolutely. With, the, with the fumes coming into your house passively over and over and over. Um, you could conceivably have a vent that's connected to your garage that when it senses too much home kit might decide okay i'd like to open this maybe it asks you if you're home or not home on your phone should i open this right now i've got a little alert and you can say yes do it um that's that's an example of using a sensor yeah, i think you like anything right the stove right uh smarter than saying the stove is on or off and you're in or out of the room is putting food on the stove to cook having things that will take the temperature of the surface of the food and, and adjust the, the stove accordingly. Take that into the shower with you. Have a surface temperature reading of your skin so it knows how to heat the water, right? Yes, things things right. that are like really tuned in to your habits as a human being living in your apartment or house or whatever um, and dialing in the the atmosphere. Having some way to say like you know i can't help i think this is all very exciting i can't help because you and i both do have apple music accounts um i noticed that you were listening to the 2017 francis and the lights album yeah and i can't help but think about that bottom track on the album called cruise where he sings about us being in self-driving cars and he says something like and we'll all just cruise but of course it's a play on the idea that if we have so many sensors and so many things taking care of us, we're not going to have to make that many choices anymore. And maybe we will just be cruising is what he plays around with. Now, I actually I enjoy his playful observation there, but I do think that there's a lot of good to be had with with these kinds of passive sensors and stuff yeah. like that. I don't think I'm becoming dumber if I don't have to turn my shower on anymore. <laughs> Fair enough. It, in fact, frees me up to have more intellectual, stimulating discussion with other humans like you, Dave. Well, that's a very interesting thing that the interesting um, thing that you bring up there, because there are a number of philosophers that feel broad strokes here that feel that when the quote unquote robot revolution happens, you know, whatever that means, that actually there could be a version where instead of death and anarchy, it actually allows humans to be enlightened and and, and all they need to do is be creative and and create things and stuff like that. Yes, it's going to be a world of artists is what some philosophers feel. So there was an invention in the 1400s called double entry bookkeeping that uh, since then, there's not been a, a human invention more important to civilization because it directly led to the Renaissance. And what the Renaissance gave us was enough leisure time to think about our existence, to explore the world around us, to paint a bunch of cool stuff and to yeah. like evolve as a species. And once we have to stop doing mundane tasks and home smart homes are a part of that, smart global supply chains are a part of that blockchain, real big part of that. Call uh, back to our Bitcoin episode. There you go. That's all going to enable us to free up more cycles in our brain and in our lifestyle to have us think about ourselves and interact with the world around us. And I think that can only be a good thing. Now, how I think so, too. I really do. And I'm, I am a bit of an optimist. I feel like we almost have to be optimists. We can't be blind, but we have to be optimists if we want to choose the optimistic path as yeah. as humanity transitions you know through all of this in fact in many ways and i don't want to get too big and broad here but like in many ways the entire this entire show is the exploration of maintaining our humanity as we embrace technology is one of the my goals with this show and it has been for the past eight years um with that said what about a naysayer that says well we're all going to turn into the people that float around in chairs in wally I, well, everything's done for them, you know, and they don't even move their bodies anymore. I'm not going to stop going to the gym. People could make that choice, but I think that there's already as much opportunity to sit on the couch all day now yeah. as there would be in that future. Maybe so that is a product of the human condition. Not so much. It might be amplified a little bit by some of these technologies, but it's, it doesn't it doesn't create that, does it? You know, it just it just dawned on me like 
the technologies that enable that are generally entertainment technologies, mm. televisions, radios, books. Those are the those are the technologies. And by books, I mean like the printing press, which allows books to happen. Sure. Uh, those are the technologies that keep us lazy. When we talk about ambient passive technology being aware of us and the utility to that and blockchain and making it economical to pay people for mundane tasks. Um, we're talking about a different type of technology. And I think those types of technologies aren't the ones that are enabling people being lazy. It is the technologies of leisure activities like watching television, reading a book. And I'm not saying reading books are bad, but you are yeah. generally not moving around much when you're reading a book. That's the thing that's going to get people fat and lazy and stupid in a lot of cases. But those technologies already exist. Maybe the opportunity grows when we don't necessarily have to go to a, a job to perform a mundane task and we have more free right. time. Maybe that grows. But that's a negative side effect of a technology. That's not the point of the technology. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So smart homes, they're, they're not going to make us. So what do, what's the benefit from a smart home then? I mean, I agree and know where we're going. I'm just trying to continue to drive this episode. Um <laughs> What is the benefit of of all of these passive sensors in a smart home? Even though we have touched on that a little bit, I'm just trying to get us back on track. Though this is wonderful. Yeah, I, I think the the benefits of the smart home is is stopping to like is freeing us up to uh, interact with other people more than we would mm -hmm. normally. Like now, is this the kind of thing? Is this the kind of thing where you know uh, certainly Google does this with um, their assistant app, and Siri is doing this more and more. What I'm about to speak about, and it's the kind of thing. So, like every Thursday, I drive to Chicago, and every Monday, I drive to Kenosha in Wisconsin. Uh, that's been the case for the past couple months. Well, um, my schedule was altered one weekend, and like Siri was telling me, like, "Hey, hey, you gotta, you're going, you gotta go to Kenosha, you gotta drive back." It was like a Monday, and I was actually sticking around in Chicago for a meeting. And Siri was freaking out and it was actively sending me notifications being like trying to help, not, not asking, not saying something's wrong, but it was like right. saying like, here, I've got the directions for you because it was feeling these patterns. Mm -hmm. Now that is something that is almost like passive observation is done in code. It's not necessarily done with a sensor. It's done because of sensors. It's done because of GPS sensors and motion sensors in the phones and right. things like that. But, um, you know, maybe it would be cool if, just hear me out. I, mean, I, I suspect that you would agree with me, but maybe it would be cool if Siri will just say starts to have an understanding of the your five person family and who needs to be picked up from school at a certain time to send your self driving Tesla or who or Apple car or whatever it is out to go get the kid to come back and maybe it confirms with you and that kind of stuff and maybe it is cool that a refrigerator knows that you just took the broccoli out of it and suspects that you're probably going to be cooking that broccoli on the stove in 30 seconds because that's what you've done for the last four months and already suspects that it knows what temperature to make that stove be and also suspects that it should order more broccoli because every fourth time you cook broccoli, you need more um, based on what you had in there, based on your eating habits. I think that that is cool. I agree, uh, believe it or not. And I think like what we see now is a very naive approach to these sorts of scheduling tasks. And that's really what these are. These are scheduling tasks. And for a lot of the things we do driven by Siri or driven by like Google Maps or whatever, we have to set these schedules. And so that's what you were seeing. You're, you're seeing a result of you setting a schedule and your phone knowing about it, knowing when a calendar event is supposed to happen yeah. and where it has to be. Consciously or unconsciously. Um, maybe not consciously, but I've created a schedule for myself. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Right. So uh, in, in, in this, this world that probably is closer than we think, I agree with you that uh, if it has a holistic view of your habits and your intentions, and when we talk about all these artificial intelligence fields in computing science, we're really talking about how, how can we teach these machines to understand what we're about to do? Not necessarily like, we, right. We know that based on the corpus of English text and the corpus of Spanish text, we can compare and contrast and we can kind of make a translator go from English to Spanish. But that's right. not really understanding what we're saying in English. That's seeing past performance and applying it to devices and computers that we already have. Mm -hmm. What we're really always trying to do is get an understanding of intentions. And that is something we have not solved yet. The best we can so do is look yeah. at look at all of the data we can divine from our phones, from text on the internet, from Wikipedia, from whatever, 
and build a database of predictions that are usually all right. Now, um, just I want to ask you another question, and we'll probably start capping this episode off in a few minutes here. But I also want to offer an observation. You know, when Siri first came out, it, it's been four or five years now, I think it was iOS seven or the iPhone seven or whatever is when it first came out. We did an episode on it on the show. Right. Um, <laughs> in fact, I like remember when the app store came out for iPhone and we were, it was right around the time we were just starting this show up. And I remember um, iOS three, when they switched it to iOS and it wasn't phone OS anymore. We talked about it in the show, but I digress. Um, when Siri first came out after the first year or so, and this is, I'll, let's consider this gossip because I don't have a source for this, but I do recall that Apple released some data that like 97% of their users didn't even use Siri. And those who did of that small percentage really only used it to set a timer. Right. And, and, every, and some people deduced from that, like, oh, well, it's not the future, personal assistance, it's a fad or whatever. Really, I think what it was is just, it's more of a matter of like, um, the, you know, what do you say to Siri? We don't, we as a user, we're not sure what that interface is yeah. yet. We don't know. Yep. Well, everyone knows you can ask Siri or Alexa or Google to set a timer. Mm -hmm. Most people know that you can probably say, please pause the song, please play the song. And we kind of know that that's part of the vernacular. I think where things like Siri are excelling now, I, I had a friend who who would never use um, Siri and they were running the Google Assistant app on their iPhone. And it was a, it was actually a gal that was on the it was she was a cast member on our show back in like season five. And finally, the Google Assistant started recommending things to her based on her habits. Yeah. And then, oh, then it got exciting. Then it got interesting because it was taking the passive data and creating active engagement so instead of you know remember pre-siri when you'd use your voice command system on your iphone and you'd push a little button down and little words would float by of things you could say because yeah. there was only like 10 things you really could say anyway yep. at that time those days are fading in a good way they're fading uh we are barely past those days so like bring <laughs> it back to the naive approach right it um it's doing the best it can with the state of the art in this kind of technology. And that state of the art can be pretty magical if you abstract away some of the processes of how these things happen. So to say to Amazon Alexa, hey, Alexa, order me some more chapstick. And then it shows up at your door the next day. Mm -hmm. That's magical if you don't see how complex and hard that is to do, both from a computing standpoint and from a manpower standpoint. Like, Tens of thousands of dollars of salaries went into that tube of chapstick showing up at your door. Those are still very naive processes because it's very human centric. Um, we're getting a little bit better at like Siri and Alexa and, and Google kind of having more commands that they can accept, but we're still not to the point of that natural understanding of a human language, of the intentions of a human. Um, that brings us back to the point you were saying before in the first part of the episode where where you said these commercials aren't really showing the the device itself. They're showing the human interaction with the device. Right. And that, that's a UX and marketing problem that they're solving through the commercials. They're they're teaching right. us how to speak to these things. It's a yes, right, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And Sorry, so it's going. it's still it's still now, more than 10 sentences we can say now, but there's still a specific way we need to interact with these for it to understand what our intentions are. You can't just speak to Siri for a half hour and expect some meaningful outcome from that. Right. Um, In fact, you know, just for the fun of it, sometimes if I ask Siri to set directions on the phone or what I'm driving or something and and it says turn left here. You know, sometimes if I'm like with my nieces, we'll joke around and if they're in the car with me, we're like, OK, thanks, Siri. Like, I know that that's not happening, right. um, you know, to say thank you back afterwards. It's not listening anymore. Now, maybe that is a little bit of that projection, a little bit of that stuffed animal has emotions thing that starts to happen. And I just wonder now, maybe this is damaging. Maybe I shouldn't be doing that with my nieces because maybe they're building <laughs> a world where these are personalities, you know. Well, not uh, only that, you could be teaching Siri, the subservient personal assistant that it deserves your thanks in some way. But in reality, so, <laughs> it is it is scum and we need to treat it as such. <laughs> <laughs> I um yes, I, I had a friend just recently. I said I apparently I always say please and thank you to when I'm engaging with Siri. For me it's Siri. 
Um, you know, probably I'd do the same for Alexa and OK Google. I just it just seems correct to be like, hey, please give me directions home or hey, could you please play blah, 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 that kind of stuff. Right. Hey, do you mind? T- p- please tell me what the weather is. It's you don't need to say that. Maybe there's a little part of me and this is not accurate and I'll even be I'm willing to make fun of myself a little bit right now when I say this. But there's a little part of me that's like, man, if Siri is recording every single thing we say when we're speaking to it and using that to learn natural language, maybe I can be my one little microscopic drop in the bucket that teaches it that sometimes people are polite. Like, <laughs> <laughs> No, I, th- I think that's entirely valid. I, I was actually thinking about this the other day and I I don't know if I tweeted it out or sent a text message about it, but I was thinking like. Man, Siri and Alexa are being trained on all of the speech and texts that are going across these networks. And we're teaching it to say, uh, I mean, in front of every sentence, as if that's the right thing, right? Like when you're engaged in conversation and you might disagree a little bit, but you don't want to flat out deny a thing, you say, well, I mean, it's this thing as well. And I feel that that is the most overused thing. And not to mention, by the way. It's a good thing that we're not trying to quantify vocal fry because there's an entire subset of humans yeah. that should yes. not be listened to. I feel like that's that training set should just be thrown out entirely. I don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, what if <laughs> anything that follows that just stop <laughs> listening to Siri, turn off, run away, <laughs> go away. So, yes, I but- agree. We're teaching the robots and that's a good thing. So for our listeners, because this show is for casual listeners and 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 the like, and uh, well, I've said it a million times, but if you're new to the show this season, my favorite critique of the show is it has been said uh, years ago that, oh, I love your show. Um, I don't know anything about technology. I love the show. I learned something. And then I have my tech friends say like, oh, I really like you know how it's just kind of casual. You're just hanging out. It's not like really too deep. So with that said, assuming that that is our audience that's listening to us, Alex, how would you suggest one might proceed if they're curious about this kind of technology and these services? If they're, you know, someone's about to buy a new condo or, or they're, they, they're not sure, but they maybe want to buy a nest or they don't know what to do. What, what's, what are your thoughts here? We can kind of finish the episode off with that. I would say, um, depending on the generation you're from, you're going to have to temper your expectations differently. I feel for the younger generations, we don't necessarily have an expectation that these things are going to be around in their current iteration forever. So when we buy a Nest, we think, okay, that'll be a great thing to have for a couple of years until something better comes along and we'll use that something better. For the older generations, you might have to think, okay, this isn't like a steam radiator where it's going to be in this apartment for the next 150 years. This is a thing that I'm going to use for a while because really when we're talking about smart homes and the Internet of Things, We are absolutely in its infancy. So temper your expectations about the durability of the ecosystems you are buying into and pick the one that you like, right? Like they're all going to be decent enough. Mm -hmm. The lights are going to turn on. Sears is going to tell you the Packer score. Alexa is going to allow you to order Burt's beeswax, whatever. Uh, Pick the one that speaks to you because no matter what, By owning it and by interacting with it, you're going to make the next generation that much better because it's going to use everything you do to train itself and become better for the next iteration of itself. Cool. That works for me. Alex, uh, we're just about out of time, so I think we should get going. Certainly, this is a topic that could keep be it will continue to be talked about. And I'm sure we will return to it probably in another within the next six months. I'm sure this is kind of how this stuff happens, you yep. know, when there's new developments. The home pod is is perhaps out by the time this episode posts possibly definitely pre-sale already happened pre-sale happened it was february i thought i had it in my notes here let me look real quick real quick feb th- feb um, three i think february third f- uh, releases february 9th oh. so i think this show will come out just days before sweet well enjoy your new so anyway, home pod in three days after the show people if you wait if you exercise some delayed gratification you could hear mm-hmm. the dulcet tones of mine and Dave's voice over your brand spanking new home pod with Siri, <laughs> the virtual assistant by Apple Inc. Uh, <laughs> indeed. Indeed. All right, Alex. Well, if people want to, I'm so happy you're back on the show. I'm, hey, I'm yeah. pleased as punch. I've missed you for years. I've, I say that every single time that you've been in town and we ha- were able to have you guest on the show. Oof. We'll be back with you in a couple of weeks. Sure we'll be will. chatting about something, which we have not picked that topic yet. If people want to uh, get in touch with you, what what you know, what's the best way to do that? Are, do? Is it mostly Twitter for you or is it other things? 
Well, um, yeah, Twitter. Yeah, this is my Twitter version of Instagram, asking you what you want to plug. Yeah, Twitter. Oh, I'm sorry, I actually, to you. you know what? No. Find yep. me on my social network, Forward Everyone. There it is. Uh, no, Twitter or Instagram. Uh, it's at works on my machine with no O in the word works. Yep. So we'll flash yep. that up. No the screen O's, or something. no underscores, all one, one thing. Right? All one thing. Yeah. I think that that's also on Instagram, but I could be wrong. Maybe Dave, I shouldn't say that. Uh, it is. It is, in fact, also on Instagram. Uh, Dave. Yeah. Where can we find you? Oh, so funny you should ask. Uh, people can find me on Twitter and Instagram by searching Raptor Paint, and that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. We uh, love it when people tweet the show at Technophiles Pod, and uh, I think, yes, um, <laughs> I, I think last week I said that our Instagram was Technophiles Pod, but it is indeed Technophiles Podcast, and we always post a lot of fun things there. I post when an episode comes out on our Instagram, which goes to tweet which goes to our Twitter and um, sometimes behind the scenes stuff. We used to years ago, we used to put all this stuff on just, our, by the uh, way, I'm guessing where the links are going to be on the screen. Yeah. So. Yeah. You're trying just, to click on the links. Just where, where yeah. I'm showing you where, where it'll be right here. I see that. Yeah. Mm, may, right maybe, up there? Up there? maybe, maybe a card, okay. maybe. maybe. I'm not sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, and actually you bring up a good point. Uh, this show, you're probably listening to this on iTunes or Google play or Stitcher or something like that. But we do also release these episodes on YouTube, wherein we, you can see our beautiful faces at 30 frames a second and occasionally some assets here and there of things we talk about. And actually, so we have been getting a little bit more response on our YouTube comments and like Facebook comments, Alex, that's <laughs> apparently nice. how our audience that's how our audience likes to reach out to us. We get tweets here and there, below. but it's really comments. So if you're watching, if you're listening to us on YouTube, feel free to throw a comment down underneath and we will uh, speak to it. Maybe we'll get back to you on Twitter, maybe right in the comments themselves. It's a fun way to keep the conversation going. So with that said, uh, you can also go to our actual website, technophilespodcast.com, where we post all all of the show notes to all of our episodes and some of our other shows like the Technophiles Newscast and even these, what I call, I call them downtime episodes, but they're kind of like Let's Plays here and there that we do. Alex nice. and I did one about a month or two ago. Oh, yeah. Wherein we discussed Bitcoin while playing the game Bubble Bobble from 1983 or something like that. Alex, I'm about to do my, I'm about to say goodbye, but it feels like maybe you had one more thing to say, or am I just reading your face incorrectly? I, I don't think I have anything of value to add to this anymore, Dave. <laughs> we can just cut okay. my mic. Yeah. It's, you go ahead. I'll sit this one out. All right, Alex. <laughs> well, I'm so pleased to have you back, and um, everybody, we'll see you next week. If all goes well, I'll be speaking with Sharif Jackson, and we don't know what we're talking about yet. He and I, literally just this morning, we were talking about what we might talk about, so we will still decide. Uh, see you later. I don't know. We don't really yeah, have an outro uh, anymore. Uh, right, we'll, we'll workshop that. Leave, leave, leave a comment in the comments for our outro suggestions, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> we get that? <laughs>